This is the 40th episode of the Author Alchemist podcast. I'm your host, Kim Bu York. Today, we're continuing the series, Deepest Fears, the fears we have about writing that hold us back from writing. Seems simple, never is. Thanks for joining me. I'm Kimbu, the host of the Author Alchemist podcast. I'm bringing my years of experience as both a fan fiction writer and a professionally published author to the problem we all love to hate, the act of writing. You can't improve on something that doesn't exist, which means the most important thing you can do is simply write anything. Just write something. I'm here to help you do that. Hey y'all, it's Kimbu. I hope you're doing well. I hope y'all are getting a lot of writing done. I am back with part two of my Deepest Fears series. As I said in the promo intro, this is about the things that hold us back from writing itself, which as you know is my focus. Get your butt in the chair, get your writing. That's the whole point of this podcast. Everything I do here is about helping you overcome the things that are holding you back from sitting down and writing the stories you want to write, stories you want to share, getting your voice out there, getting your writing out there. Can't happen unless you've done some writing. That's the real trick. I get emails every day like how to market your book, how to talk to your email newsletter list. And the assumption is always that you already have 10 books under your belt to share and to, you know, throw out there in the world and not a lot of us do so <laughs> there's a, there's a step in between there isn't there which is what gave me the idea to write the deepest spheres series because when i sit down and i talk to other writers oftentimes we spend a lot of time talking about why we're not writing sometimes that's technical reasons we're having trouble with an outline we're having trouble with a character arc we are you know dealing with world building of course that's always in my case the truth just world building never ends we might be doing some research my friend gina's doing research into her characters backgrounds as they're based in the american south during the 1960s ish late 1960s so not too far long ago although it's you know i was born in 69 so for me it's kind of a long time ago but she's having to do a lot of research so these are technical things that can stop you from writing but what we often talk about are the things that are more psychological or emotional the fear that we have of writing something that's inferior, the the shame we feel about writing something that other people might not approve of. That's what we're going to be talking about today. The previous episode, Deepest Fears, episode one, I ended up talking mostly about the Mary Sue phenomenon because the accusation that you're writing a self-insert character, which is essentially what a Mary Sue is if you're not familiar with the term, It's often used as a way to shut the writer down, to make them stop writing whatever they're writing and, you know, I don't know, write something else or not write anything at all. Last episode, I talked a lot about how that particular accusation and criticism against writers is often used against female writers, women writers, specifically Uh, Even though there are plenty of examples of self-insert fantasy characters that have been written by men pretty much from the beginning of time, they don't get that accusation where women do. And it is a way to try to curb the voice of women or uh, women-identified writers who are trying to, you know, live in the fantasy world, create some escapism, create some joy. What I didn't get into in that episode was the second half of that, which is the fear of revealing your true self. Oftentimes we steer away from writing something that we think might be accused of being a Mary Sue or a self-insert character because we don't want people to come back at us and say, oh, you just wish you could fly on a dragon and, and fight evil wizards, don't you, huh? 
And, you know, of course, the truth is I personally would love to fly on a dragon and fight evil wizards as long as I won. I I don't want to fight an evil wizard and lose. That wouldn't be any fun. Why that criticism can hit so hard is tied to the fear of revealing your true self, which, of course, is the shame and embarrassment of being vulnerable, of being seen for who you are which may or may not be true, you're writing fictional characters, they may not have anything to do with the life that you personally want to leave or the desires that you have or or the dreams that you have. But putting it out there as a possibility means that you have to be seen as a writer because that's what people will look at these days. The, the veil of hiding the writer behind the work is gone. These days, it's very common for authors to be active on social media and very visible, coming out from behind their works and being people that readers engage with, talk about, read about just as much as they read their stories, whether it's on Tumblr or Twitter or Facebook or TikTok these days, there is a connection that is built Whether or not the author wants that to be a two-way street or not, it often ends up being that way. So being seen, writing something that will come back and be used against you as a way of discrediting your creativity and your stories. And the easiest way to avoid that is, of course, not to write anything. Which I hope if you're listening to this is not the path that you've taken. (laughs) I admit it was a path that I took. When I talk about not writing in the 90s, a lot of it was because I wanted to write stories such as polyamorous romance stories or, you know, queer gay male romance stories, bisexual romance stories, which I knew would not be appreciated, shall we say, by the traditional publishing industry as self-publishing and a lot of indie publishing even wasn't available or easily accessible back in those years. And I often crouch it in those terms, but the other side of that fact would be me admitting that those are fantasies that I have, that those are things that turn me on or inspire me romantically or just inspire me creatively in general. A lot of fear there, which is not entirely unfounded. Especially these days in the fan fiction community, we've seen this kind of accusation twisted by fandom aunties and fandom puritans that if you're writing about something bad, then you're promoting or affirming it. So they're conflating the author with a story. For instance, if you write about domestic violence, then obviously you are supporting domestic violence as an activity. You, you write about abuse, then you're an abuser, for instance. Those are accusations that have been leveled to a lot of authors in order to shut them down because the readers don't like the stories for whatever reason. So the fear is real, though, which is what the point I'm trying to make. And hopefully not to skip. We're talking about deepest fears here. And that's definitely getting piled on and doxxed and harassed is, I think, everybody's deepest fear in general when it comes to social media these days. I'm not exactly stating, you know, uh, hidden truths or anything. That's a pretty obvious one. Pulling this back, though, to you as an author, or to me as an author, to us, and we're sitting there trying to figure out how we're going to write these stories and what kind of reaction people are going to have to them. It's really important to understand the difference between guilt and shame. Now, Brene Brown uh, has written a lot about this. And if you're not familiar with her, then what rock have you been living under? You can go Google her. I have some links in the show notes to some of her work. Certainly the TED Talk that's been listened to like, you know, 45 million times is a great place to start. The differentiation she makes between shame and guilt is critically important. Where guilt is the idea that you've done something bad that you need to apologize for, atone for, fix in some way. Shame is the idea that you've done something bad and that makes you a terrible person. I think the fear of being seen comes from 
the shame side of things because guilt guilt cannot be escaped that essentially like there are things that i've done that are bad that i still feel guilty about decades later honestly not going to go into those stories they are ancient history and in some cases i've actually been able to fix the situation in the sense of apologize atone uh, make reparations where i can try to fix the relationship if I, if possible if the other person has been interested in it which isn't always the case but i still carry the guilt but i've done what i could to fix it and so i can go forward in my life thinking well I've learned a lot. I won't make that mistake again. I'll try to be more self-aware about how my behavior impacts other people and I will try to be a better person. As opposed to the shame side of the coin where I'm just like, I was a bad person once 25 years ago, because remember I'm 50, so 25 years ago is uh, is well within my lifetime <laughs> lifespan. But I hurt them and so therefore I am just a terrible person and there's no coming back from that and I'm going to apologize forever and just grovel and hide myself in my office under my desk because there's no point in me coming out because I'm just a terrible person. Two very different reactions to things. And as authors, we understand intellectually that critique is an important part of becoming a better writer. It's what editors and alpha readers and beta readers and even arc readers, advanced reader copies, if you're not familiar with the term, that's what all of those support networks are for is to try to make us better writers. They are not there to make you feel bad about being a writer in the first place. When you think about this fear that you have of being seen of being judged for what you're writing, try to parse out whether you are feeling guilt because there is actually something about that story that might affect people in a bad way. Or if it's shame that you are writing something that is embarrassing and marks you as a bad person. I'm going to use my own concerns and fears about writing poly romance with male male female leads because that has been something that has weighed on me the shame cycle of it has been this is a weird romantic framework i could have gone in directions of shame where i thought you know i'm corrupting people with this kind of romance i'm being critical of, uh, you know, traditional heterosexual monogamous relationships, and therefore that makes me a bad person. Not necessarily the fears that I had about it, but that is certainly a direction that you could go in something like that. But for me, it really ties back to the idea of the shame of being seen as a pervert, as someone freaky and weird who likes writing about these kinds of you know, unnatural, and I'm using that with finger quotes, even though you can't see me doing it, relationships, a natural type of, you know, paradigms of romance. Ooh. And, and people would think, well, that's, well, that's obviously something she really wants. She really wants that weird, bizarre type of romance in her life. Well, the fact is, yeah, I kind of do. I think it's hot. <laughs> You know, it's I'm not going to lie about that, but here's the difference. Should I feel like I'm a bad person for having fantasies about polyamorous romance? The answer is no. So the question then becomes, do I feel guilty about it? Have I done a bad thing? And of course the answer to that is also no, no, I don't have I have nothing to apologize for when it comes to the polyamorous nature of my stories. There may be other things I do need to apologize for. There can as a, a white middle class Southern American author, there may be elements of racism in my stories that I haven't seen yet. That I'm just incapable of seeing because of the privilege I have in our society. So if somebody points that out, yeah, I'll, I'll feel guilty about that. Absolutely. And I will look at ways where I could not do that in the future. And if possible, to fix the thing that I have done in those books so that that element is not there or is presented in a way that makes it very clear that that's about a certain character's perspective or, you know, whatever the issue is. 
happy to fix those types, but I'm not going to feel shame because I'm a terrible person and I've done something bad. A really good way to try to parse out those two elements, uh, shame versus guilt, is to rely on the people who are helping you, but to also understand where they are coming from. Certainly anyone who's your alpha reader or your beta reader or your actual editor, whether it's a story development editor or copy editor or proofreader, should be people who are encouraging you and supporting you. I have friends who worked with editors who were not like that. Editors who were cruel and abusive and talked down to them. It was terrible. And I was thrilled when they finally got enough to fire that person as an editor and move on. Because if your editor is trying to make you feel shame about what you're writing, if they're telling you that you're a bad person and you're a bad writer and that, you know, you need to completely change who you are and what you're writing about because it doesn't live up to their standards, mm, that's a huge red flag, my friend. Yes, Beta reader and editor relationships can be abusive. So keep an eye out for that. If those people are coming at you in ways that are personal and are designed to trigger shame, then that immediately invalidates their opinions. You know, check mark that box, kick them, kick them off the island, you know, vote them off the island, whatever, whatever. I don't, I never watch that show. So, you know, get them off, get them, get them far away from you is what I'm saying. Don't listen to what they're trying to tell you. If one of your better readings come at you with criticism about something, a feature of your stories, uh, something about the character that really bothers them, and they're asking you to look at different ways of presenting that character or explaining to you the reasons why that character is bothering them and what it could mean to the story, then that person might be triggering your guilt, but are doing it in a way that's a positive critique of the writing and they're trying to help you. So that's why I think these are really useful tools when you sit down and you analyze what the interaction with this uh, critique is and what it's trying to inspire in you. And that's just as true for your inner critique as well as your external ones. If you read something that is not good that you've written, and we've all experienced that, and you sit down and you just think, I'm a terrible writer, I should never even tried this, I am, you know, I should be ashamed of just trying to put any of my work out in the world, and this is ridiculous and I'm just going to start writing forever, maybe stop stop right there and think about what you're telling yourself as a person. You're shaming yourself. That's not going to improve your writing. It's not going to improve you as a person either. There's no point to it. Instead, maybe get some distance from the material that you're reading and really allow yourself to think about it maybe a little objectively if that works for you or just not think about it at all for some time. That's what works for me if I'm having trouble with the story or I've hit something that, that is really bothersome about it. I'll just put it away and ignore it, pretend it doesn't exist for a little while, and then come back to it. And yes, in the end, this advice all comes back down around to feel the fear and do the thing anyway. That's really what it always comes back around to. But the point that I make in these types of podcasts is that you have to be self-aware about what exactly your fear is. You need to understand different techniques you can use to counteract those specific fears. And you need to understand the differences between shame and guilt in this particular situation, because that will really fundamentally change how you are approaching your own writing, your career as a writer, and your relationships with people who are critiquing your work, whether you're being paid to do so, or they're volunteers, or they're just readers out there. I did have a book, Mixed Signals, actually under the Cooper West pen name, that the first edition 
was bad. <laughs> I don't mind telling you that. The publisher that I had at the time was pushing me to try to write something quickly and get it out there. And so I did. But when the book was going through its second edit, I wrote back to the edit editors I was working with and the publisher and was like, does this ending seem chopped off? It doesn't feel right to me. I was right. They were wrong. They were, they were like, no, it's fine. We'll just get it out there. Readers will love it. I was right. They were wrong. <laughs> I repeat this a lot. Uh, readers did not like the way it ended. They thought it was very rushed, and it was, and kind of chopped off, and it was. And those were very valid criticisms. But then there was this one review, <laughs> I will never forget it, where the person talked about how the book was rushed ending, kind of chopped off. But throughout their valid criticism, they kept peppering things like this author must hate her readers. This author is just a terrible person for having done this. I didn't do it on purpose to ruin people's lives, right? I was just rushing a book and my editors kind of didn't listen to my own criticism. And, and it was just a confluence of reasons of why that story was let out into the world the way it was. But that reviewer was trying to trigger my shame, was trying to make me feel bad as a person for having done some bad writing. I am glad to say that I realized the difference. I felt guilty about ending that book that way, but I certainly didn't do it for the reason that this reviewer was claiming. When I got the rights back to that book, I completely rewrote the ending. It's twice as long now as what the original uh, edition was and I'm much happier about it and readers are much happier about it and I was able to do that because I was not shamed to the point of being unable to even look at the book of being saying yes that's right I just hate my readers and and I'm a terrible author and a terrible person so I'm just gonna pretend this book never happened and and we're all just gonna go hide under our desk I feel guilty I felt fear about having done something not great. And then I went and fixed it. And the same thing is true about writing my polyamorous romances. I had great fear about being seen, of being accused of Mary Sue writing, of having people say, well, she just has these fantasies about being in a polyamorous relationship with two guys. Well, those are all true. That's, that's all true to a certain extent. And I don't, I don't know about the Mary Sue part. I don't, I don't one-on-one -on -one identify with the, the female characters that I write. There are parts of me in them, of course, because that's how writing works, especially with escapist writing. You want characters that readers will be able to inhabit as they're reading. But, you know, is this, is this me being, you know, a weak-minded, terrible person trying to accost other people with my perverted fantasies? No, it's not. I don't have any guilt about that, and I certainly don't have any shame about it anymore. That is the point I want you to get at as well. So sit down, have a think. Feel the fear and do it anyway. <laughs> this is always what it boils down to. I'm not lying to you when I say that. And then go write the stories you love to read. And that's it for today. Long episode. Went off on a few rants. Thank you for hanging in there with me. Now it's time to get to writing. Thanks for listening to me ramble on about writing here on the Author Alchemist podcast. I'm Kim New York, and I hope this episode has helped clear away the cobwebs from your inspiration. Now, time to get some writing done. <laughs>